Are you okay, Madam Monitor? Yes, it just came up. Thank you very much. Oh, Sorry no about problem. that. You're good to go. I, I understand technical difficulties this morning. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Supreme Court. We have two matters down for argument today. The first is Halliday versus Commissioner. Each side will have 30 minutes to argue. The appellant may reserve any portion of that time for rebuttal. So please identify yourselves for the record and let me know whether you wish to have any time for rebuttal. Uh, you're muted, sir. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, my name is Vishal Garg. I represent the petitioner, and I'd like to reserve eight minutes for rebuttal, please. Thank you very much. Justice McDonald will be our timekeeper, and you've been through this experience before, um, I, as yes. I recall. Thank you very much. Whenever you're ready to proceed. Uh, this case concerns the habeas court's decision to grant the respondent's motion for production and order the petitioner to turn over his prior counsel's case file to the respondent. The two issues before this court concern, first, whether that decision was subject to appeal, and second, whether materials in that case file were protected by a privilege. Uh, I'm going to start with the privilege issue. The critical issue there is waiver. Uh, the parties agree that there is an implied waiver of the privilege. The, dispo the dispute is about the scope and timing of that waiver. Counsel, uh, Justice Ecker. Counsel, before, before you get into the substance on the jurisdictional question, um, you know, I this this case reminds me a lot of a case that uh, this court decided a couple of years ago. I think it was called uh, Reading Life Care against Reading. Um, Justice Doria authored it. Uh, the state cited it, and um, I'm not sure you responded. But, you know, uh, the whole thing in that case was that we just didn't have enough information. Uh, uh, we didn't have a specific, definite court order uh, to review when we found that we didn't have jurisdiction. As a result, it was about attorney, it was a claim of privilege. It wasn't attorney client, it was some new privilege about an expert. Um, it seems likewise here. I mean, there was an order to turn over the file subject to a privilege log um, and a determination of relevance. There's 10 bankers boxes of information here. Um, I would think that the right way to proceed would be as, as attorney Baer pointed out on page 25 of, of her brief in a sensible fashion, the lawyer has to go through, um, that is your office or would have to go through the, all the files, every piece of paper and determine the relevance uh, determine, make a threshold determination of relevance and make a threshold a determination of a privilege, whether work product or whatever, make a privilege log. And then if there's disputes, you can bring it to the uh, uh, court. There may not be. I understand you have a timing issue because you want to preserve your right to keep your case wide open, but you're going to have to make some decisions about what's relevant, what's not. Um, but, you know, we don't know if there's a, a dispute here. We don't know how broad it is. Uh, What's your response to all that, sir? Um, so first, I think that there are concerns with uh, producing a privilege log because it essentially gives the respondent an itemized list of the material deemed to have been privileged and not relevant in the file. And so it's still revealing the existence and nature of privileged material, even if it doesn't specify the exact substance of it. Well, I'm going to interrupt um, you just, right there, sir, if I may. This is done all the time, all the time in civil litigation. Now, in criminal cases, you know, there's there's not as much discovery. And so I understand it's it's arguably for more foreign land, but it's done every day. And that's the whole point of a privilege log is that you can identify as much possible information about the doc underlying document as, as, as can be done to allow for a ruling without revealing the privileged information. Um, so I don't, I, I don't buy uh, your, your first point. I mean, I don't, it's, it's done all the time. Um, and I think the, the second point here is that, um, So, and I think it's partly related to the first point, is that once that log gets created, um, so 
I think it's kind of hard to answer this question without going into um, some of the issues with the nature of the privilege. Um, so part of the issue here is that counsel also objects to their own work product being created or being disclosed. And so I'm not sure whether or not that includes permission to list that on a privilege log. Um, well, on that and, one, I mean, isn't the, 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 the client has a right to the, the entire file. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, I believe that it's a little bit more complicated than that. So your claim is that there are portions of the client's file that the lawyer has a right to keep from the client's own review? Yes. Um, uh, and that's, do, you have a case, do you have a case that would do you have a single case that would support that proposition? Um, I don't believe there's a Connecticut case on point. Um, I'm relying on ethics opinion 84 three, which essentially says that the attorney's work product belongs to the attorney and not to the client and need not be disclosed to the client when providing the client with the client's file. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with an attorney's lien where the attorney can, a retaining lien where the attorney can keep the file and hold the file, uh, if they haven't been paid, um, subject to court supervision, but I, I wasn't aware of any, I'll, I'll look at the 84 three. Um, uh, but, um, I wasn't aware of any case that would ever provide that. Um, so, but I've, I've, I've detained you long enough. So why don't you, why don't you go ahead with your argument? And I'm sure my colleagues have questions. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, attorney uh, Garg, there's a question from justice McDonald and then justice Khan. Thank you. Um, well, sort of along the same lines, let's assume for the moment that this is a final judgment um, and we need to get back to that at some point too. Uh, this discovery order was directed at your client, right? Not at the office of the chief public defender. Uh, that's correct, Your Honor. So are all of the bankers boxes that we're talking about in the possession of your client or are they in the possession of the office of chief public defender? Um, I believe copies of them. I don't know if my client has possession of copies of all of them. I know that um, the petitioner was permitted to go in and inspect them. The actual physical bankers boxes that comprise um, counsel's file were, I think, still with the public defender. But I believe that either copies of those were turned over or that the petitioner was permitted to inspect those. Uh, is it your understanding that when a discovery request is, um, is served on your client that obligates him to go out and acquire documents that he doesn't already have in his possession? Um, I think in this case, to the extent that he had access to them and would have been able to produce copies of them, it seems as though the discovery order was requiring him to do that. Okay, and um, but the, but the office of chief public defender was never served. I mean, you're, you're assert, essentially asserting a work product privilege, which is different than the attorney client privilege, right? Who's correct? Whose privilege is the work product privilege? Um, it belongs to both the attorney and the client. Um, so, so how could how could the attorney or the client hand over work product that um, that it belongs to the attorney without the attorney having been served with the discovery order? Um, that I think is exactly the problem here is that the client's been ordered to turn over materials that he can't turn over. Um, over the objection of his attorney who has an independent work product privilege in that. Um, I cited ethics opinion 84.3 for the existence of that privilege, um, but I think there are also uh, independent cases that talk about it, um, mostly in the federal context of the attorney having an independent um, work product privilege to prevent the disclosure of the attorney's material. I mean, my, my final question, I guess, is this, this, or maybe it's partly observation. This is part of the problem when uh, a habeas action is a civil action, but you have 
players who uh, don't regularly participate in the civil process. Why wouldn't the proper way have been for the state to serve the Office of Chief Public Defender, and then the Chief Public Defender would have had an opportunity to file a motion to quash the, the subpoena uh, for the production of the documents. And then you would have potentially have gotten to what the first issue is, whether or not a decision on that is a final judgment for purposes of appeal. I mean, I think that would have been a proper way to do it. Um, the fact that that wasn't done here, I think, is part of what creates a problem that necessitates uh, the appeal, which is that the petitioner has been ordered to turn over stuff that um, at least arguably doesn't belong to him and is kind of in between a rock and a hard place of deciding whether or not to either violate the court's order or potentially subject himself, open himself up to liability by turning over material um, that is... Uh, under a claim of ownership by a third party. All right. Well, that that gets back to my original point. I, I don't understand how your client has an obligation to go out and acquire documents that are not in his possession to comply with the discovery order. Normally, it's what you have possession of uh, that that you need to turn over. Is that not correct? Um, I believe that's correct. Um, and I don't know how clear the record was on this in terms of whether or not he had possession of all of the documents or whether or not he merely had access to them. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Khan. Uh, you're you're muted. muted, Your Honor. Still mute, Justice Khan. I'm. Can you, you hear go. me now? I'm so sorry. There's apparently a huge delay, and the the bar doesn't come up even when you hit click. I apologize, okay. Counsel. I have um, two uh, questions uh, for you. One is uh, follows up on both questions you've been asked already. Um, Justice Ecker is absolutely correct. Privilege logs are produced all the time, not only in civil cases, but in criminal cases. It's routinely done in federal court. So I fail to see how a privilege log, which is the proper method to be used, would disclose anything uh, that would be work product. In other words, just like attorney-client privilege, you can produce a work law, a work a uh, privilege log that just indicates what what it is, whether it's a document, a letter, a memo, and a general description without disclosing the content of it and uh, protect it. So, uh, you know, I, I don't see how, um, I, I don't follow your argument that you would be disclosing the content of anything by producing a privilege log. Um, and how that would harm your client's interests. But my biggest concern is if your client's not in possession of some of these records and uh, the file belongs to your client, I, I thought that was what the case law typically would say, it doesn't belong to the lawyer, it belongs to the client. How does your client then have standing to assert the work product privilege? Um, so, I believe the client has standing to assert aggrievement from the decision that um, orders him to turn over work product. Um, but if it's not his work, if it's not his privilege, how does he have standing to assert it? Um, so he's not the one asserting the privilege. Um, counsel asserted the privilege. Uh, the problem is that he's been ordered to turn over this material that is protected by the privilege, and that's the reason for the appeal, is that he can't do that without subjecting himself to liability for turning over materials that he's been told not to turn over and that don't belong to him. I thought, though, okay, so your client has it, has them, and has been told not to turn them over. Um, he does not have them. I believe he has some of them. I believe that he certainly has access. He could go in and make copies, or at least well, his attorney could go in and make copies of anything that they don't physically have. 
Okay. Parties are often asked to, un unless there's a claim of attorney-client privilege, are often asked to produce records that they didn't create themselves necessarily or weren't originally in their possession. For example, the state uh, is required to turn over its file, even if it has interview reports or other information that belongs to police department or some other entity, correct? Uh, correct. Okay. So I guess I'm trying to, I'm still struggling with why is the procedure laid out on page 25 of the state's brief? How does that harm your client's interests in any way? It would allow for both the attorney-client privilege to be asserted and the work product claim to be asserted and then presumably resolved by the court. In so general, why shouldn't we let that process happen? Um, I think this court could remand to create a privilege log and then have the case back up here after that. Um, but I think there are a couple of problems with the process of doing that. Um, the first is that any description of the um, of the kinds of materials is either going to be too vague to allow the court to rule or is going to need to be specific enough such that it is um, revealing the actual nature of the work product involved. Um, I mean, just as an example. But, is, isn't, but isn't that what happens all the time, counsel? That's what privilege logs do. What you're arguing seems to be, for some reason in this case, a privilege log, which is the traditional route to go, would never work. My question to you, my final question to you would be this, because I notice Justice Story also has his hand up and I don't want to take up all your time. So my final question is this. If, your client, if the attorney had been grieved, there had been a grievance filed against the attorney, raising perhaps related to these claims, and the attorney was defending either a grievance or a legal malpractice lawsuit, would the attorney then be able to use the work product without even consulting with your client? Presumably, they could waive the privilege and turn it over, and they certainly would, right, if there's something in work product explained why they weren't unethical or why the lawyer wasn't uh, incompetent? Um, yes, I think if they chose to waive the work products, um, I think at that point you'd have to ask whether or not the implied waiver from the client exists. Um, certainly once the hearing starts, that would exist. So the uh, the attorney would certainly be permitted to turn that over to I'm have it put into evidence. I'm talking about the work product. I'm talking about the work product not the attorney-client privilege. Oh, um, yes. I believe counsel would be able to turn over work product at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Justice Doria. You're welcome, Justice Khan. Justice Doria. Uh, you're on mute, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Chief and Justice Khan, for that introduction. Uh, I... Um, so how confident are you, counsel, that that you're you can assert a work product privilege on behalf of the public defender's office? I, I always thought when you have stuff that is privileged, you tell you know, you can tell somebody I'm I'm turning this over unless you come in and do something about it and they can come in and assert. Um, am I wrong about that in this context? Um. So I think you're not wrong. I think what happened here was when that conversation happened, um, my understanding is that the petitioner's trial counsel, and this is, I think, in, uh, it's either on the record at the last hearing or it was put in a motion for, I think, reconsideration, um, is that there was a conversation between uh, the petitioner and or the petitioner's counsel and counsel for the public defender's office, uh, the public defender's counsel represented that the materials or the work product in the file belonged to the public defender and that the petitioner was not being permitted to turn that over. Um, I don't believe that they came to a hearing after that. Um, 
So this is, uh, I'm going to ask Attorney Baer a similar question um, just about, you know, how, how you all get to a, a resolution of this. So we, it frames, I think, our view of this particular question. But it seems like we have an issue coming before us that we have no law on. You know, attorney client, I guess, has not come up here in this context in habeas. The state says it's an issue of first impression. And we have very absolute positions being taken by you, by the court, um, and I guess by the state. I mean, the, the state wants everything. I don't know if that's usual. Do you, maybe you can tell us whether that happens routinely in habeas. Um, but uh, it's hard and this kind of goes to the final question, uh, judgment question, but it also is kind of a prudential ripeness sort of issue. Usually we tr would try to tease out uh, what a privilege is or any area of the law by looking at some documents and figuring out what. So can you react to that as, as maybe as, as sort of a framing your final judgment? Why, why would we be deciding this or asking somebody to decide this now? Sure. I mean, I think that there are... Um a couple of issues here. I mean, I think that the the court can decide the question as to um, whether or not the order was proper without there actually being a full um, a privilege log stating what is and isn't in the file. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that there, I think, certainly are materials that are relevant in the file that the petitioner claims remain protected by the privilege. Um, going back to something that you said earlier, this is it is highly unusual for the respondent in a habeas case to request an entire file. Um, and I think it's a little bit important to go through a little bit of the history of discovery in this case. Um, initially, the respondent requested, so the parties engaged in informal discovery, which is fairly standard. Um, the respondent then requested all materials that had been provided to the petitioner's mental health expert. Uh, that was ordered, turned over, and was turned over. The respondent then requested an entire copy of counsel's file, which was denied. Um, the respondent renewed that request with some limitations after the case was moved to a new court, um, and the request was then granted. Um, so I do think, I mean, the petitioner is in a position where he kind of has to take an absolute position now, um, because he has already turned over the materials that have been requested. Um, and the respondent in this case has asserted repeatedly that the respondent would be satisfied with nothing less than the entire file. Um, here the respondent spoke with counsel for 45 minutes. They were fully forthcoming, answered all of counsel's questions, indicated no memory lapse. Um, and the respondent came back and said, I'm not going to be satisfied with that. Even if they're fully forthcoming, I'm not going to be satisfied. I want the entire file. The respondent has made no showing as to why it needs this file, why it has any sort of compelling or substantial need. Um, time is up. May I finish my thought or? You may. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the respondent hasn't shown why it has any need for the file or why it would be prejudiced without it. It hasn't even suggested any materials that might be in that file that it believes that it's entitled to or explained why it needs it. Um, in light of that, I think whatever privilege remains in the file is sufficient to override the respondent's request. Um, and I will save the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. I believe you. Uh, Justice Khan, do you still have a question? Your hand is up and I don't get any longer. I, I. You just <sighs> muted yourself. <sighs> so there's about a like 30 second delay when you hit the button. And then if you leave the cursor, it, it uh, mutes you again. I apologize. I did, but I'll wait till rebuttal to, to ask the question so as not to take up time. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Attorney Bear. May it please the court, my name is Catherine Baer. I'm a senior assistant state's attorney here on behalf of the respondent commissioner of correction in this appeal. This appeal uh, really starts and ends with the first issue, which requires this court to assess whether there is a final judgment. That's the story. Uh, let me just make sure I'm not muted. Yeah, okay, I'm not muted. Um, 
I'm sorry to do this, Attorney Bear. I hate when people did it to me, but um, I, I think you can handle it. Uh, I, if you could just maybe frame for us this dispute, it, it's it's useful to me at least to kind of know, especially when government agencies are at issue, um, what the origins of the dispute are. Why is this coming up now? Why has it, why do we have no case law about this? I know this is a compound question, but do states attorneys rarely ask for this kind of discovery? Do they just live with a grant or a denial? Is it just that you got a judge who was willing to engage on this and they're usually denied? Um, is there something about this particular case or this particular habeas? Or was there a change in tactic or policy by the chief state's attorney's office? Could you speak to that just generally? Absolutely. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no change in tactic or policy. My understanding from speaking both with the habeas trial prosecutor in this case and in other habeas matters that I've had the opportunity to work on that um, for the most part, uh, the parties have been able to follow practice rule 2338 and engage in informal discovery. Um, and in fact, um, from speaking with the trial prosecutor in, in this instance, uh, she had indicated that, as a matter of course, a lot of times the entire file was turned over just informally uh, when there were ineffective assistance claims uh, alleged. Um, I, I don't know if no, Your Honor wishes no, me no, to. You, you, can, you can keep. You can. You can keep responding to me. Uh, 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 Justice Eckers just getting in the queue. Okay. Very good. Um, so, and then frankly. If it wasn't being, if the, if the entire file wasn't turned over, the trial prosecutor just had to make a decision as to whether it was worth pressing the issue or not. I think, frankly, once Judge Feger issued that decision in Breton back in 2006, I think that had provided some guidance in the area of uh, implied waiver um, or the applied federal law, which seems pretty well settled in this area. Could you, could you react to this? Um, um, it, what you Which put down is sort of the procedure that you, you would suggest. Um, maybe it sounds reasonable. It sounds like a rule. It sounds like something the rules committee could, could, could look at. I mean, it's half a rule. I'm sorry. They made it discover. Just, sorry, yeah. we're, we're yeah. getting an echo and some kind of strange background sound from you. I'm having a lot of feedback. Could you, could you speak the story so I can see? Is it me? Is it me, uh, Roberta? It stopped. I think it may have been because Attorney Bear's microphone wasn't muted. Okay. And so, so I'll just, uh, am I okay to go on, Chief? Um, so I guess you can react to that. It, it, it feels like a rule to me. We have a rule that is very limited in discovery, but but is it is it better? I mean, I know you have a final judgment position, and so, you know, it maybe goes to that, but... Is this better to be litigated in a case or should we get a rule? I mean, I would hate for only Judge Blue's litigants to be subject to this. Uh, I think what Your Honor is getting at um, gets into a little bit of a tricky area in terms of creating a rule that would, um, to the extent that it would inter intersect with the Sixth Amendment and the effective assistance of counsel, I think it would be um, something that might be beyond the purview of the Rules Committee. So I think this is an area where, um, to the extent that the constitutional implications of the right to the effective assistance counsel come into play, it might be a slightly blurry area that might not be totally amenable to rules. Um, but, but certainly in a more generic sense, could the Rules okay. Committee okay. create process? Absolutely. Okay, I take that point. Good, thank you. Justice Sacker? My question, I guess, follows from the conversation you just had uh, or the discussion with uh, with Justice Doria. Um, uh, ABA formal and, 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 it, and it relates to the formality or informality of the process. From reading uh, ABA formal opinion 10456, right, which was 2010, it really sounds, according to the ethics people, at least, or some of them, um, like uh, it's very, very dangerous for counsel to proceed on an informal basis. And in fact, the whole point of that um, formal opinion, which is it's, it's attached to the uh, amicus brief. Uh, I don't know if you're, um, if, if you're familiar with it, uh, but, but uh, it, it really 
seems to count on every page seems to counsel against informality and say, look, this should be done under judicial supervision. And I can see good reason why. And in fact, your proposal on page 25 seems to uh, contemplate that, um, you know, because there is a there's a very large risk um, on whether again, whether it's a, a property based risk or something else, there's a big risk on the on, on the part of third party counsel to do any direct turnover anyway. I understand it wasn't necessarily raised in this case because it went through petitioner's counsel. But anyway, if you can comment on on that point and the need for uh, judicial supervision at some level, um, I'd appreciate it. I would agree that I think that's why there needs to be a procedure either endorsed by this court um, or, or perhaps rules that, that allow for this um, possibility of court intervention. Because even as, um, you know, there were a couple of district court of Connecticut decisions, lower court decisions cited um, in the respondent's brief that touched on this as well. The problem, of course, right, always the rub here with habeas state litigation is, is purely numbers. And, um, you know, I think the petitioner takes the respondent to task a little bit in his reply brief uh, that if, if, if efficacy shouldn't dictate law. Well, and that's not what we're saying, but, but we can't ignore it either. I mean, the fact is an evidentiary hearing in every single case involving ineffective assistance of counsel um, would be quite burdensome, and, and there should be an allocation of, of duty uh, to do some of the legwork on the part of counsel first, and then have that opportunity to bring any disputed areas to a court for uh, judicial intervention. Justice Kahn. Thank Thank you, Chief. Um, and I, I saw Justice Secker nodding, so it sounded like he too was done with his questioning. Uh, so this is a follow-up to that. In fact, Judge Kravitz, in the decision that is attached to your brief, points out that even in the federal system, they want lawyers to meet and try to resolve, turn over what there's no objection to, and then create a privilege log to what is objected to, whether that be work product or um, attorney-client privilege. I, too, have issues around whether this is a final judgment or not, and whether the work product claim was adequately preserved below or not. But it seems to me that, like the federal system in habeas, if we're going to require the trial courts to litigate these discovery disputes, without even letting, in every case, without letting the lawyers first try to figure out what whether there even is a dispute. And if there is, produce a privilege log, and then the court can decide it. Otherwise, it would seem like uh, habeas petitioners wouldn't even get to their case for a long time. I doubt that either the state's attorney's office or the chief public defender's office wants to spend resources litigating uh, issues that may never need to be litigated because the parties agree. Uh, it may be that the, the state looks at a privilege log and says, typically a party would say, look, I looked at the privilege log. I don't take issue with items two, three, four, five, but seven and eight, uh, I think we're entitled to because it's either a time frame or relates to an issue that's been filed. I think, doesn't it really come down to the issue of once there's a claim of ineffective assistance, there's an automatic implied waiver of the attorney-client privilege. And if the claim relates to attorney incompetence as well, obviously ineffective, that there's an implied waiver to work product. And then the, the onus is on the party to um, claim that it's not relevant. As, and so this gets to my final question to you is, don't you think that the federal cases, one, support the notion that we wouldn't do this up front? In other words, that the parties would try to resolve these issues. And two, uh, my, my final question is, uh, uh, if you do that, well, let me have you answer the first question and then I'll ask the, the final Yes, Your Honor has summarized the respondent's position, which is that it is an implied waiver at the time that the claim of ineffective assistance is alleged. Um, 
and that uh, federal case law would support that. I would also point out the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, grappled with this issue back in 2016. That decision is cited in the respondent's brief, Commonwealth versus Floor, F-L-O-R. That was um, actually a case where the petitioner's counsel had asked for the opportunity, let me go through the files. There had been a discovery order. Um, the trial court said you have to turn over uh, everything relevant to the claims. Um, and petitioner's counsel asked for the opportunity to be able to go through the files first, and the trial court had said no. And ultimately, the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania ended up saying, yes, you have to give petitioner's counsel this opportunity to sift through, create this privilege log, um, and, and all of the rest. And my final question is, as I read Judge Blue's um, opinion, uh, order, he's not saying turn over the entire uh, file. He's saying turn over those portions of the file that relate to the claims of ineffective assistance. Uh, so I did not read his order as saying turn over 100% of the file, but rather go through the file, turn over what relates to the issues, and if you have claims of privilege, then bring those to the court's attention. That's exactly right, and it's something I wanted to be clear on here today with the court, that um, while the initial motion filed by uh, the respondent had requested uh, copies of all defense file materials, although interesting, this goes to a question um, from Justice McDonald uh, to my opponent, that initial motion clarified that are in his possession. It was the second motion where um, the state requested copies of any materials contained within the underlying criminal defense files that relate to his claim. And that is what Judge Blue ruled. Uh, that, that second motion, of course, can be found in the petitioner's appendix on A77. And I, and I want to address the point that was raised by Justice McDonald earlier, this idea of um, couldn't the state have filed something on the Office of the Chief Public Defenders? It's not clear at what, well, no, l let me back up. I think it's abundantly clear that it was not, the respondent was not aware of who possessed the files or where they were until after Judge Blue issued its ruling. And in fact, there were representations made by petitioner's counsel during the February 22nd, 2019 proceedings where petitioner's counsel was talking about going through the uh, materials. This is on page 17 of that February 22nd transcript. And she's she's indicating, this is counsel for the petitioner below, I would have to call the New Haven office because some of the files are still in boxes here. I, I have to see if I can get someone to pull someone from my office to assist with any kind of privilege log. There are implicit representations that petitioner's counsel has access to everything. Um, and so it's not entirely clear that the respondent knew of this, of this duty. Even if it did, it wasn't until after Judge Blue issued its ruling um, in early March and after this appeal had been filed on March 15th that uh, for the first time in that motion for reconsideration that this issue of the Office of the Chief Public Defender um, having the interest was, was explicitly made to the court. Anything further, Justice Khan? Justice McDonald and Justice Doria. Uh, thanks, Chief. Um, well, let me ask you, first of all, for work product, whose privilege is it? The amicus concedes on page three of their brief that the habeas petitioner can waive the privilege. To waive the work product privilege? Yes, Your Honor. So, so a I have to go back and dust off the research I did when I was in private practice. The um, the privilege of of gaining access to the thoughts and impressions of the attorney regardless of whether they are ultimately used in the prior litigation those are the those are the prop, those are the privilege of the client not the attorney well i think at a minimum they belong to both or at least that's what petitioner's counsel has i think agreed to no what does our what does our case law say 
Um, I don't know that our case law is clear on this point. It hasn't been litigated frequently. Um, and so I'm not sure that's entirely clear. Okay. Um, let's assume for the moment that the uh, privilege at least in includes the attorney having uh, a privilege on the work product. Why, and I understand you're just here on the appeal. Um, why would it not be trial counsel's obligation to notify the attorney whose privilege is involved that he or she may have to assert that privilege in court? Why isn't, why isn't it the proper methodology to be to serve a subpoena on the office of chief public defender so that the issue could be joined in court so that privilege could be resolved? Uh, why is it not required? What, what was the language that your honor used in the question? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the privilege is the attorney's, at least in part, does the attorney not have to have notice that their privilege is at stake and an opportunity to be heard? Um, that certainly seems to make sense. Do I know of a case or a rule requiring that? No, I do not. But the other thing is this whole discussion with the lack of clarity here or to the extent that this ownership issue is not fleshed out is, is all the more reason why this is an improper ruling for this court to be reviewing at that time. Um, as I've pointed out in my brief there, very well might be more litigation related to these issues, particularly given the timing of the of the raising of the work product issue, um, which, uh, you know, as I set forth, is really as was really more presented as, a, as this property type issue, um, you know, may well occur prior to this issue globally being uh, resolved in the pending habeas matter. Thank you. Justice Dario. Uh, so, you know, w what you said to my last question about rules was, you know, probably because of Sixth, Sixth Amendment issues, it, it, it needs a litigated case at some point. Um, we don't have any law. It seems like we're, we're you know, you're, you're, is some of your answer to Justice McDonald on particular issues of privilege. And you're, maybe you're making the final judgment, you know, argument somewhat reluctantly. I won't put words in your mouth, but you know you feel like you have to because that's our case law. Can you tell me wh when you think it would be final, or when I mean there or there are other avenues, I guess, to get this issue before the court? Because usually, I mean, I think the case used to be Melia that would say you have to go to the end of the case. I don't know if that's still the precedent. I should know that, but um, and unfortunately. The, the petitioner has a real case, has hit, it's, it's himself, it's his privilege. So when would you think this would be final enough for a ruling, you know, under, everybody claim the privilege that they need to and we have documents? What, have you given that some thought? I think typically the, the, those issues have been litigated once a privilege log is produced and then if there's any further dispute as to what portions of that privilege log are gonna be turned over, that's when it usually comes before the court um before the before the trial court but but when do you think of, i mean does he have to lose his his habeas for it to come up here that's usually the case in in discovery disputes yes and to answer your the first part of your honor's question malia would still be controlling in the respondent's view in that um this this would have to wait until the end uh of the habeas litigation and that's because there are mechanisms for protecting the pr privilege as the matter is litigated, namely potentially sealing orders or protective order, in-camera view, and the like. Now, there are other avenues that this appeal could have presented itself to this court. That would have been a public interest application by, of course, a party, or had the public defender's office intervened, I think you'd be in the more traditional area uh, in our cursio jurisprudence in terms of a non-party um, having that, that separate and severable action uh, ruled on uh, um, and, and then thereby permitting review under a cursio prong at that point. But so the, so the, the, the state isn't 
dead set at, at, against having this litigated before any particular petition or wins or loses his case. I mean, you could do, you might be able to do a reservation. You could agree on a factual record or something. And I mean, this is going to come up in every case. I don't understand why it doesn't come up in every case. And um, we're, we can't, if, if your suggestion is we can't do this by rule, um, maybe everybody could get get a real a case before us at some point without him having to lose his case. Although and, he, and might there he might avenues, prevail. There are avenues to do that, yes. And, uh, you know, I think the petitioner has pointed out um, while a public interest application was not pursued in this matter, there have been extraordinary circumstances where um, Koma Sarjewski back in 2011 being the most recent where uh, effectively the appeal was treated as a public interest application um, after the appeal had already been filed. Uh, the only problem with that from the respondent's point of view is that, um, well, two things really. Number one, it is sort of an unusual procedure and, I, and it's, it's unclear uh, whether that's really good policy for the, the court to sort of direct the um, process of appellate litigation. Number two, there were some timing issues that were really in play in Coma Sarjewski. Namely, that involved the disclosure of a, uh, the contents of the witness list. The appeal um, came up before the court in June. The evidentiary portion of the criminal trial was set to begin in September. Um, and, and of course, this court ended up uh, treating it as a, as a public interest application and, and releasing a decision in August prior to the evidentiary uh, portion beginning. So, um, so those are some things that, you know, would militate against sort of sua sponte, considering this uh, as a public interest appeal. Anything further, Justice Daria? Justice Sacker? I mean, another thing that would militate against treating it as a public interest appeal now is that, you know, the, the, the final judgment rule, it's not just a formal rule. It's, it, there's a reason behind it. One of which is, you know, I'm not, I just don't know, this goes back to, I guess, uh, something I was talking with uh, Attorney Garg about. I'm not sure we have enough information right now. In fact, I'm pretty sure we don't. We don't know if there's a real dispute because counsel could go through, uh, right now they've taken a, a, a almost a property-based, you know, you don't have the right to have these. Um, but maybe they'll go through the files and find out there's nothing in there that, to, to hide from and uh, nothing in there to be protected, I should say, um, and it's all fine. Maybe they'll reduce it to two documents. You know, Maybe there's a document in there in which the lawyer wrote down, I, th I think this guy's guilty, you know? And then we'd have an issue where, you know, there'd claim no relevance, there'd be some objection and Judge Blue could address it in the first instance. But at this point, we just don't know. Um, isn't that a real problem with taking the case in its current um, uh, posture? Absolutely. I mean, for all the reasons that your honor just uh, stated, um, th the fact that we're at this sort of um, embryonic stage, we at, we at least need to get further and to actual orders that are specific and concrete as to what is being turned over or not or um, what have you in order for this court, you know, frankly, in the response view to issue sort of any intelligible ruling with respect to the merits of, of, of the um, uh, appeal. There, there's also sort of a um, sort of an inconsistency underlying the petitioner's position where below petitioner's counsel um, agreed readily that the respondents would be free to talk with counsel prior to trial, um, but not but not have access to the materials. Um, it was just something I wanted to, to note that it, it seems to cut against um, common sense. Now, I know Attorney Garg is, is pressing for this sort of at the time of trial or, or potentially when habeas, uh, or excuse me, when criminal trial counsel testifies during the actually evidentiary hearing. Um, but it, it seems to me that, and again, this goes to this over, overriding truth-seeking process uh, that the discovery process serves um, that that's really what is at what is at issue here, and that's the prejudice. And, and Judge Blue um, nailed it in his uh, at, during that February twenty second proceeding, that page A one eighty nine of the uh, petitioner's appendix. That the prejudice is the fair litigation of the claims that the petitioner has placed in issue um, the very the very 
conduct and, and potentially contents uh, of, of uh, the uh, criminal proceedings. And um, it, it's, it's ultimately the, the truth seeking process that, that suffers here. I did want to make clear, um, and I think the petitioner takes a sort of a contrary view. Uh, counsel, his uh, trial, excuse me, counsel for the respondent below represented, and this can be found in the petitioner's appendix at page one, uh, A185, that she had spoken with the two uh, attorneys who represented the petitioner during the criminal proceedings. They could talk about various things, including their defense theories, how they divided the labor, um, and what they worked on together. Um, but she did represent that there were um, many, many nuances that they could not recall it. And that was the basis for uh, uh, for the motion. And, it, and again, it, it, this goes back to Justice Khan's point. At that point, the, the respondent wasn't moving to get the entire file. They were, they were moving to get um, the materials that were relevant to the claims. And when the claims are as broad reaching as they are in this case, which included Failure to conduct an adequate factual investigation. Failure to adequately research the legal issues. Failure to adequately prepare a defense, as Judge Blue indicated. I mean, it's hard to imagine what's not relevant to the, such the claims having such breadth um, as they do in this case. And that's in the petitioner's right, absolutely. But it's also part of his decision and his attorney's decision about what claims to bring and what claims um, not to bring. If I could just have a moment. Counsel. Um, a point I just want to make about the work product rule, uh, you, you know, we have to recall too, and of course I stand by the, our position that, that it's not even that issue isn't properly before this court, but, um, you know, the rule derives from Hickman versus Taylor, 1947 U.S. Supreme Court decision, and the the purpose underlying the rule was to protect the lawyer during the adversarial proceedings from those notes, that research, doing all that legwork, and then effectively having your opponent be able to reach in at the last minute and get access to that material, which causes this, this inherent unfairness. The interests are, are, are much different in the habeas context where that matter has concluded. The criminal prosecution is completed. Um, there may or may not have been a direct appeal that's gone to resolution. At that point in time, the purpose underlying the work product um, is no longer being served in the sense that it's not it's not me saying to attorney guard prior to today, hey, hand me your notes before all our arguments so that I know what you're going to talk about. It's it's what happened in this earlier proceeding that has now concluded. Um, so the interests are, are, are very different. Senior Associate Justice McDonald. Thank you, Chief. Um, Counsel, I just did some brief research and found a couple of cases where, um, for odd reasons, the uh, the request was for uh, the work product of the prosecutor. Um, and in that situation, um, you know, you, you, where you're representing the state, uh, you don't have a client. It's only the pro work product. So only the attorney can, can assert the work product uh, privilege. Is that not correct? That would be correct. So, I mean, d doesn't that inform this analysis that that uh, that uh, the that the, the privilege really is the office of chief public defender uh, and not the privilege of the, of the petitioner? Uh, uh, it, it may well be. Uh, you know, I would just point the court to the fact that the public defenders themselves, in their amicus submission. Um, agree that the petitioner can waive the privilege so um how can how can the petitioner waive the attorney's privilege with respect to work product it it and again maybe this kind of kicks into that ownership is issue if if the petitioner has copies of it in his possession at the time when he's litigating a claim where he's placing an issue the work the mental impressions of that attorney it, it would seem to me that in that instance, um, the petitioner w would have to turn them over. Now, whether, as you suggested, that attorney itself, him, him or herself, needs to intervene, assert a right, and litigate it that way. Um, but again, in, in a vacuum of 
case law on this issue, uh, I, I don't know that we have definite answers. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, Council? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Attorney Garg. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think the first thing I want to address is this question of whether or not this should be done via rules rather than um, through litigation. Um, and I do want to point out that in uh, pretty much every other jurisdiction, there are specific discovery rules that I think at least um, give some guidance as to this. Um, and I think that's part of the problem with relying on federal cases when deciding how to rule here. Um, in federal habeas, discovery is governed by the federal civil discovery rules. Uh, in Connecticut, discovery is expressly not governed by those rules. Um, but I do think that, I mean, to the extent that procedures could be developed for this, I do think that that should go through the rules committee. Um, I also think it's uh, it's important to point out this this fairness issue that the respondent keeps kind of coming back to. Um, and specifically, he, the respondent isn't able to give any specifics about how it would be harmed. I mean, there is this sort of general notion of litigation would be more fair if the respondent had access to everything that the petitioner had access to. Um, and I think that that's probably true. If the parties mutually had access to all of the same information, litigation would be more fair. Um, however, our practice book has expressly decided that the parties aren't going to have, as a matter of right, access to all of the same information. And instead, the only thing that they have a right to is a witness list and to disclosures of experts. Um, and so to the extent that what the respondent is asking is that this court finds that fairness promotes complete discovery in all cases, I think that's a request that needs to be made to the Rules Committee and not to this court. Um, I also do want to point out a couple of things. Um, I don't think, looking at the, uh, the amicus brief, it's not clear to me that they're conceding that the petitioner can waive um, the work product privilege on his behalf. I mean, the petitioner's position in this case is that both the client and the attorney have independent rights to assert the work product privilege. Um, and so even if the petitioner waives his side of it, I think before it can be turned over, the attorney also needs to waive their side of it. Um, and I also want to point out, I think the respondent may have missed a couple of things in terms of what the respondent's counsel below said. Um, the respondent's counsel below, when talking about counsel, the petitioner's trial counsel not remembering things, says, and this is on page A185 of the petitioner's brief, there must be many, many details and nuances that don't re they don't recall. Um, and so there's no suggestion that counsel ever answered a question with, I don't remember. It's just this kind of speculation that there's going to be things um, that they don't remember and I need the file to know all of those, even though they haven't told me that there are things they don't remember. Um, and I will defer to the, the questions. I don't know who is first. Justice McDonald and Justice Khan. Based on your uh, based on your answer that the privilege for the work product is both the clients and the attorneys, why would why wasn't it incumbent upon the petitioner to cite in the office of chief public defender um, to join this issue properly in the trial court? Um, I think it should have been incumbent on the respondent because the respondent is the one who is seeking to pierce the privilege. Um, so I think the respondent ought to have notified the office of the chief public defender that it was making this request. Um, certainly, I think it the petitioner could have done that. But to the extent that the respondent is requesting counsel's work product, and I do want to clarify, I mean, the... Uh, the the motion for production specifically requests counsel's work products. Um, I think it counsel the, the 
you know, the, the problem I'm having is uh, this with with the, with this being the petitioner doing this. This is nothing other than a discovery dispute, which is not a final judgment. Had the attorney been uh, subpoenaed and there was a resolution of the attorney's privilege, that would have been a final judgment for purposes of appeal. Would it not under our existing law? Yes. So, so I mean, you're right. It, it, it probably would have been great for the uh, for the state to have initially uh, given notice to the Office of Chief Public Defender. But doesn't that still present a problem for you that the uh, OCPD was not a, a, a part of this resolution at the trial court level? Um, it does in terms of the final judgment issue. Um, I think, however, that the case is, and I think you're referring to, uh, it was Abreu and Woodbury Knoll. Um, I think the only difference there is one of standing. And here, I believe the petitioner does have standing, um, for the reasons that I said before, he's essentially in this position where he has to do something that could expose him to legal consequences, either from the court or from prior counsel. Justice Khan. Thank you, uh, Chief um, Counsel. My question is similar in a way to Justice uh, McDonald's question, and that is, you said the work product privilege uh, is duly asserted. So even if your client had waived it by raising claims relevant to it, uh, he would. Uh, there would still need to be a waiver by counsel to turn those documents over. So my question to you is, if your client, instead of a habeas, had filed a grievance against his attorney, claiming either an ethical violation or, or say even a malpractice claim, are you saying that the attorney could not, in defense of such a claim, produce work product? He would need your client's permission to introduce a work product privilege that he retains to defend that claim? Um, no, and it's the same thing. I think we agree that there is an implied waiver. Um, however, why not? I why not? Counsel, j just stop a moment. So, so you, in that situation, you're saying no. The attorney doesn't need your client's waiver to use those documents, meaning there's an implied waiver. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Uh, and we agree that there is an implied waiver in the habeas context. Um, our assertion is that the implied waiver doesn't become effective until the petitioner presents evidence. And when you look at the cases, a lot of them rely on the presentation of evidence as the time at which the implied waiver becomes effective. Why, why do we have to wait for evidence? It seems that it, you're saying basically it doesn't kick in until the trial. What happens to counsel preparing? Now you turn over 10 boxes of documents and counsel says... I just got these this morning. Now do we have to postpone the trial for counsel um, to review those? Uh, yes, and may I respond to that question? My time is up. I just want to make sure. You may, counsel. Okay. Um, yes, and I think there's there's a couple of reasons for waiting until the time of trial. The first is that it best protects the privilege. Um, going in, if the petitioner, say, has a claim that a witness... Counsel should have called a witness who had heard some third party confess to the crime. Um, turning over materials before trial means they get, you know, the investigative report um, describing the witness's testimony, maybe counsel's notes on a meeting about the witness's credibility, maybe counsel's notes about the witness's criminal history, um, all sorts of information pertaining to that witness. If we wait until the time of trial and counsel says, well, I didn't call that witness because I wasn't going to present someone who had two larceny convictions because the jury wasn't going to trust that guy. Um, then we only need to turn over the materials that we know are actually relevant to defend the case. Um, and we protected the privilege with respect to the remainder of counsel's work products. Um, and because there's no depositions in habeas, because counsel and the petitioner are often at odds, we don't know how counsel is going to defend himself in the case until the time of trial when counsel comes out and says, here's my reason for doing this. And that's the point at which 
um, I think it's fair to make the determination as to what gets turned over. Uh, I realize that that means that there's often going to be a delay. Um, and I would point out that it's not, it's fairly typical in habeas cases when an extra day is needed for that day to be several weeks or months down the road. Um, I've had cases that have lasted more than a year um, because of the realities of habeas. The docket is clogged and it's often difficult to find a day that works for everyone until several months out. Um, and so even though that does sort of at a glance, that sounds like a problem. We're going to have to wait a month before we can get back and do the cross-examination. Um, that's actually not um, that unusual for habeas cases. Um, and if there are no further questions, um, I will rely on the briefs and the argument that I've made up until this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, counsel. With that, we will be in recess until the next matter, which I believe starts in six minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor.